I'll be talking about uh, how we in Project Ego uh, automate the change detection. And so the title of the presentation is Starts in Automated Detection of Changes in the Vermicle Million Skin. So you have uh, heard this metaphor before already. Uh, so we see the lunar canal as the urban chameleon skin and graffiti in general. Um, and so why we want to do this uh, in Project Indigo, we, uh, as you have heard uh, already, we want to, we try to document it all. So we really want to have as much graffiti, as much of the new graffiti as possible. And that has so far proven to be uh, extremely challenging uh, because I think all of us, or at least uh, the non-graffiti experts in the, in the consortium, we're uh, a bit uh, overwhelmed by the amount uh, of new graffiti that are added there uh, every day, basically, uh, or even on an hourly basis in some places. And also, Donald Canal is super large, so we have uh, 13 kilometers of uh, walls that we want to uh, monitor and document. So it was uh, from the beginning actually clear that we need uh, somehow a way to automate this uh, change detection as well. But I will show you um, how we did it so far, the change detection. And there we uh, mainly relied on uh, memory. So actually we relied, re he relied on uh, Stefan's memory um, because he's just a, a graffiti uh, expert uh, of Vienna, I could say, and knows uh, the, the Donut Canal uh, like probably nobody else. So he was uh, spotting most of the new uh, graffiti. Uh, but of course, uh, even he uh, misses sometimes uh, graffiti uh, because they're oversprayed too quickly or they're just too small or uh, yeah, he just uh, doesn't see them, which happens. Uh, and he doesn't just rely on his memory, but we also used or he used the mainly uh, Instagram as well, where he also spotted a lot of new works because, uh, as we've seen before already in the discussion session, uh, artists or uh, creators um, share their work uh, often on Instagram and that we uh, can also pick up. And we've also uh, established a, a hashtag as well, so Indigo specific hashtag, Indigo Lona Canal, which is also picked up uh, by some uh, creators already, and that helps us a lot to a filter for new works so we uh, quickly can see uh, artists or creators who post their new works on Instagram. But as said, we still uh, miss, uh, we missed a lot of new graffiti and that's why it was clear that we need some uh, automated way of change detection. And there uh, the aim or uh, for me as a photogrammetrist, uh, it was actually quite obvious to use photos for that as basis for the change detection because it's a visual uh, phenomenon and uh, photos are a visual uh, way of uh, dealing with them. So it was, uh, the aim was quite clear. We wanted to see for uh, every part of the donor canal uh, where changes occurred and that can then be visualized by such a binary change map where you clearly can see that was uh, generated manually, by the way, where you can immediately spot uh, where new um, tags or whatever have appeared. Um, yeah, so that was, that is, that is the aim. But this aim uh, comes with two challenges mainly, and that I want to show you now. Uh, first, the first challenge is how can we actually derive such uh, images which are uh, aligned more or less perfectly? So the uh, technical term is how can we co-register images in a very uh, highly automated way, uh, which makes them computable and also uh, possible to uh, run them through a processing chain to automatically derive such change maps. And then the second challenge is uh, once we have these uh, co-registered images, how can we then derive uh, the actual change map from that? And uh, to demonstrate how difficult this actually is, uh, I just computed here the uh, differences in uh, intensity values or in gray values. And what you can see here um, is the map of these uh, differences from uh, 0 to 255, uh, with black being the highest differences. And what you see is if you simply compute the dif difference between these two images, you end up with uh, such a change map which shows you basically only where is light and where is no light. So illumination uh, is really a tricky, a tricky uh, thing that we have to overcome. So shadows play an extremely important role in this whole change detection, and that's some uh, that's a challenge that we need to overcome in, in all this. Uh, so to solve all these problems, we came up with a super sophisticated workflow, of course, super scientific and all. But I won't go through this uh, workflow chart. <laughs> But I will uh, break it down to you in a bit more uh, digestible slides. And uh, that starts, of course, with the image acquisition. So um, uh, as you maybe know, Donald Canal is quite long. I mentioned already 13 kilometers of, uh, of, of uh, walls and uh, 8 kilometers of uh, other sites approximately long. So we need a way to acquire images in a very uh, quick and uh, yeah easy way. And there it was uh, 
or no, actually, uh, that is the ultimate goal. For now, we actually concentrate on a smaller part here at the, one of the legal wars, so at our test site that we have identified. So everything you will see in the coming minutes uh, will focus here on this uh, small part um, where we test all the algorithms and all the all the stuff that we're doing. Uh, and then we, once we know that uh, some workflows work, uh, we can uh, upscale them to the whole tunnel to another square. Um, so yeah, back to the image acquisition. Um, as everything uh, must be very. Uh, uh, so actually, there are two um, requirements to this image acquisition. It must be uh, quite accurate, so it should not be blurry or uh, over or underexposed. And secondly, it must be very fast because uh, everything is. Uh, yeah, it's a huge area that we want to monitor. So uh, we would need a mobile platform, ideally. Um, and we thought maybe we can ride uh, on a bike along the Donau Canal with some GoPros mounted on the bike. And in that way, we can uh, yeah, acquire images in a very efficient way. And therefore, um, he had actually produced this uh, frame here where he mounted some GoPros in it. And with that, uh, yeah, we can then cycle along the Donau Canal. But for now, we actually just walked along it and uh, took two images every second. And so we end up with uh, tons of images, which have a high overlap. And that is uh, important, as we will see later, for all our processing chain. Um, so yeah, in total, we acquired, uh, we have 29 acquisitions in total for 11 different dates. Um, uh, so we have a huge uh, image data set, which uh, we need to process. And that's actually the next, po next point. How can we do this uh, core registration I've talked before? And there we use uh, something that's called structure for motion. And uh, I break it down to you very, uh, very quickly. Uh, what is important here is that once we identify uh, identical points in two images, we can orient images relative to each other. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, that's what it's uh, all about in this uh, core registration. We need to have overlapping images where we can identify uh, the same objects in one, in two or more images. And once we have this, we can orient all the uh, images that we've acquired for one a day relative to each other. And what you see here is uh, each uh, rectangle, each rectangle corresponds to one camera orientation. So um, uh, we can chain them together in a way, and that's uh, called a, a bundle block. Uh, and one, uh, and the cool, really cool thing is we can also do this over time. So once we have one acquisition from this date, we can use uh, the next acquisition from the from two weeks after or from one week after, and we can still orient them relative to each other. And we can do this for every of the 29 acquisitions and end up uh, with uh, 29 different uh, of these uh, of these colors. I only plotted three here, but we can do this for every acquisition actually. And what is also cool is we can uh, um, derive such a 3D model. And that is also important because when we have uh, the 3D model, we can then put all the different textures so we can map all the different uh, RGB values from all the acquisitions onto the 3D model. So eventually we end up with uh, 29 different um, 3D or differently textured 3D models. And I can show you also this uh, short video here where, I've, uh, where all the different acquisitions uh, are shown in, uh, as textures on the 3D model. And what you can see is um, that there is, of course, a lot of graffiti change going on. But uh, what also uh, catches the eye is uh, the illuminations, the, the shadows, also the different uh, camera settings that were used. So all that uh, is changed, that is perceived by us, but uh, we should actually ignore. Um, so that was the first part of the core registration. But uh, we still need to somehow derive uh, these uh, core co registered images that I've shown before. And therefore, uh, Shiat came up with a brilliant idea, as I think uh, we introduced so-called uh, synthetic cameras. So we actually uh, do exactly the opposite of what we did before. We don't uh, compute camera orientations, but we say uh, we have a camera orientation. And from that camera orientation, we render uh, an image. So uh, you can imagine it as if you were standing in front of this uh, 3D model at Donau Canal in this exact location and uh, take an image. And we just did this artificially, so we can exactly control uh, what we want to uh, cover in the image. And uh, the result of uh, each of these synthetic cameras is then such an image, uh, and that we can again uh, render from all the different 29 acquisitions. And for every of the 17 different uh, synthetic cameras. 
And so we end up with a quite nice data set. We've seen total approximately 500 of these uh, images for all 29 uh, acquisitions or epochs and for all uh, 17 synthetic cameras. So that was uh, challenge one. That was uh, already, is already solved, I would say. And we can also upscale this approach to the whole donor canal. Of course, it takes some processing. Uh, but uh, I would uh, consider this challenge more or less solved. And now I come to challenge two, which uh, is still not uh, completely solved, but uh, I will talk about an approach that we are currently following and which already also produces some nice results. And that's the hybrid change detection, as I call it. And there we actually um, include two different approaches. So one very established one, IRMAT, I will talk about this in a few seconds, and the rather novel one, which uh, we've kind of developed uh, within the project and that's a descriptor-based approach. And the aim is, again, to derive such binary change maps. So first of all, we use this uh, EMAT approach. And uh, I say I tell you the name now, but uh, you probably won't remember it anyway. It's uh, quite complicated. Iteratively reweighted multivariate alteration uh, detection. And it was introduced by Nielsen in, uh, or actually this uh, iteratively reweighted version in Nielsen 2007. And uh, what uh, is important to know is that it detects uncorrelated in, uh, information between the uh, two input images. And uh, when there is uncorrelated information between two pixels, um, then this is a proxy for change. And that we can then use uh, to uh, derive such a change map. And important to know is also that it's uh, largely invariant to uh, linear scaling and thus also to illumination. However, as you can see here in this example, uh, it's also prone to noisy the results and it also doesn't really work in completely unchanged scenes. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a state of the art solution already, but uh, it has its uh, negative side as well. That's why we decided to introduce or to come up with a, a, a second uh, algorithm or a second uh, approach, and that's the descriptor-based approach. And there, um, maybe shortly, an explanation of what a descriptor is. A descriptor can be understood as a fingerprint of a pixel or of a point in an image. And what you see here is uh, an, an extraction of uh, many, many descriptors that were found by an algorithm and that were uh, found to be discriminative, so to be uh, kind of special. So each point represents kind of a special fingerprint in the image of the image. And now we can do, we can search for these fingerprints in uh, both images, of course. So we end up with thousands and thousands of these descriptors. And what is then the important thing is that we can uh, try to match these descriptors. So we have these uh, overlapping images and we can search uh, in a very small radius around uh, these pixels or around it, these descriptors, um, how similar the descriptors are. And when there are, when there are super similar, we know, or we can assume that no change has uh, occurred there. Uh, and that can also be seen here, uh, the patterns uh, of these, of the density of the descriptors uh, show that uh, there are many uh, matched descriptors found at uh, unchanged scenes where there, where there is this new graphic to here that no descriptors are found because we could not simply match uh, descriptors here in this area because they were not similar because the uh, object has changed, the graphic has changed. Uh, it becomes even clearer when we uh, compute such a density map of these descriptors. So we see here, uh, and maybe I'll show you the, the ground truth here as well. We see here, um, that the patterns match actually quite well. It's not uh, perfect, of course, but we see uh, the black areas here where there is a low density of match descriptors matches quite well with the um, actual change that's happening. Also, this rows here um, is also kind of depicted in, in this descriptor-based approach. Um, so that uh, that was a quite promising result, and that's why we decided to uh, combine both methods. So we simply said, okay, when we detect change here in this earmat. Uh, so that's the earmat result, that's the descriptor result, and we combine these results by uh, saying um, if there is change detected here and here, we also uh, say in the final map that there is change. And that would then be um, the final change map of uh, this uh, example input image. And uh, as the result is actually quite satisfying, is if we compare it to the uh, ground truth, um, we said, okay, let's uh, try this in a more systematic way because there was only an example. And therefore, we conducted a quite big experiment where we actually used all of the acquisitions uh, for all the 17 synthetic cameras. So there are lots of uh, combinations that are possible. So we took the first uh, acquisition of uh, 
at, at the end of uh, October 2022, compared it to the next acquisition and uh, did it for all the other acquisitions. Then we took the second uh, date and compared it again to all the acquisitions. And again, we did this uh, for all the 17 synthetic cameras. So all in all, we have uh, 6,900 combinations. Um, so image pairs that we can compare it to. And that's also exact in, uh, the exact number of reference maps that we had to uh, generate uh, in a semi-automated way. So uh, you can imagine it was a lot of uh, also manual work. And also that's one of the major outcomes, I would say, of this research so far that we have this uh, huge data set uh, with annotated change uh, and also with the underlying uh, image data that we have. So that can be, we would also publish this, of course, uh, to help other people working on this stuff. And I think that can be of great help. Um, but first of all, it's of course for us to test our algorithm and how good it is. And that we did uh, by conducting uh, two experiments, uh, really. And that was uh, the first experiment where we uh, simply looked at the binary classification of whole images. So there we just uh, asked our question, is there any change uh, in the region that is covered by this image with a threshold of uh, 5%? And if the answer is yes, by our algorithm, the consequence would be that we would go out uh, to Donau Canal to this exact location and make our proper documentation for which we have already our processing workflow. And if no, uh, no action would be, would be needed and we could just uh, yeah, chill at home. Um, and we could answer this question, and now I come to the first actual result uh, of this whole analysis. Uh, we can answer this question correctly with our uh, uh, hybrid approach in 86% of the cases. So 86% of the images we can correctly classify as change or not change, which is, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, and a good first result. But of course, we want to dig deeper and also see how good is this performing on a pixel level. So for this, we really looked at the individual pixels. So we compared two of these uh, epochs and we wanted to see um, how does our algorithm uh, perform? How does he detect change compared to the ground truth that we collected? And there we can mainly make uh, two observations. And the first one is, that yes, indeed, we achieved goal one. It's super robust against a lot of uh, a lot of change that's actually not graffiti uh, related. So it's super robust against illumination. Uh, we hardly ever detect any sh misinterpret shadows as graffito uh, as graffito based change. So that's uh, first cross in our list. So we succeeded in that, but um, it's not yet sensitive enough. So what we found is that uh, when we have uh, graffiti that has, uh, that features more new additions, like here, where, an art, uh, where a creator came to the place and started with the graffito uh, one day and then came back two days later to make some rather small additions here, these blue stripes or some small uh, of the red parts here, which uh, yeah, you only see when you look a bit closer. Um, so that's the actual change map. And what we detect is uh, not all of the change. And there we are not yet sensitive enough. So we would not uh, detect all the, the smaller tags or the small additions, which was uh, the initial goal, of course, of this work. Um, yeah, so uh, with that, I actually come already to the conclusions. So what we achieved was uh, a very fast uh, image acquisition. So we have a setup which allows us or will allow us to uh, monitor or to acquire images from the donor canal in yeah very little time. Uh, we can uh, perform a very efficient co-registration. So we have a very solid databases to perform all of the change detection algorithms that we're developing. And uh, we have already developed a very robust uh, hybrid change detection method, which is uh, uh, robust against shadows, for example. But, uh, and that's where we will uh, pick up uh, on working. So we will continue working on this, of course. It's not yet sensitive enough uh, to very small changes and also not uh, two monotone backgrounds. Uh, I've not really talked about that, but uh, uh, yeah, that's also an, an issue at the moment uh, that we want to deal with. And uh, with that, I thank you a lot for the uh, for your attention and uh, I'm happy to ask uh, answer questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Also for the time, exactly twenty minutes. <laughs> okay, so I will start the discussion. If there are any questions. Alex. Hello. 
the set before, maybe I misunderstood, but if change is detected too long, then you have to actually go. But to, to detect these changes, you have to go on two more or yeah, I mean, yes, that's that's kind of indigo specific. So uh, that's tailored around our workflow at the moment. So what we do is uh, a very specific uh, acquisition of, of uh, the images. We not only take one image, but we take several images from different perspectives to render the three D model to to get the three D model and render an auto photo as well. Um, so yes, indeed, we have to go out uh, twice. Uh, once for the change detection, but that can be done in a super quick way now in less than an hour. And then we only have to go to very specific spots. So we would uh, save, I don't know, 80% of the time because 80% of the drone icon has not changed. But I right. do have to go out again if you already yeah. have pictures. Yes, you would not, you would not, uh, you would not necessarily have to do that. But okay. for the standards that we want to achieve, uh, I think I, uh, mm. I speak your mind as well. Um, we, we want to have simply a better documentation, but yes, of course. So the second time we get closer or more. Exactly. I mean, we, with this uh, go through setup and it's the resolution is simply not so high okay. and we only have, uh, yeah, it's, it would be possible. It's a proper documentation, of course, but not, uh, uh, yeah, not for, not enough for us, I would say. I understand. Thank you. <laughs> So creating the three D models is that is that like a standard kind of uh, is this one you guys developed from the from the rule or is that the standard the three D model creation the, and no that's actually a kind of a standard task for in uh, the computer vision and photogrammetry kit and then so, and you guys stuff to do the the you would have to have one set of sort of overlapping images to try to get the page so like whatever that space yes yeah, sure. mm -hmm. exactly. mm -hmm. And then it's actually just sort of release always some sort of starts. Are you? Are you quite out of release in area? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, yes. yes. No, that, especially this uh, James map data set oh. we want to release rather soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, would you go for a setup also something a little more darker and lighter? Mm -hmm. or you mean with less illumination? Yeah. Um, well, there are limits to it, of course, but as soon as you can identify uh, uh, feature points or some uh, some special points in the image. It's uh, possible to to uh, orient the images, and then the effect on change detection must be uh, uh, examined uh, separately. But yes, of course, it would be possible in dark environments as well. Okay. But do you have a use case or? Yeah, if something more might, but maybe I can ask you right Yes, yeah. sure. But given, of course, if I may add, given that the, let's say that you can hold the camera stable during the time of the explosion. So if it's a dark environment, the GoPro is not that light sensitive, you very quickly you run into longer shutter speeds. And then the human cannot hold the camera very stable, even the tenth of a second is too long. And then you end up with blurry images. Okay. So for the change detection that we work, if, we, if you would like to have very nice photographs, this would not be. So, oh. Thank you. Mario, can you zoom in and possibly? If it's up to large, yes. Yeah. Don't have an idea. Okay. Yes. Yeah. With money, everything's possible. Just come for a purpose. Yeah. yeah. I have a couple of minutes for. So the call is that um, you could do everything in one school. That you go there with the gold probe, and then in the field you detect where is the changes, and then you right away take those pictures. Yes. So the, at the moment the process is uh, twofold. So we go in on Donut Canal, we quite ideally take all the images, run it through our, pro, uh, our pipeline, and then tell uh, the one who's photographing go there and there and there and uh, do the job, uh, take the images, and uh, yeah, that would be the the uh, case in the mission. Yes. So you could do everything theoretically in one day, everything really the same person theoretically could do both. Yes, yeah. You were made a, a march along the railway going to change the pictures. Um, no, that's, that's, uh, that's exactly what I explained here with the 
um, camera orientation that can be that's not necessary. We don't have to stay on a specific spot, but we can uh, compute the camera orientations in post processing. So we, we know we can compute where we stood. We can compute the spot where we were at that time of the image acquisition. It wasn't a question. Did you find any of these methods? Most likely to be the most efficient of what Um yes, I mean yes, of course I was looking into literature uh -huh. and there is not a lot of stuff going on in this field, of course. And nobody's done this for graffiti, obviously, but a lot of people have done it for remote sensing applications yeah. with satellite images. Um and there these uh, approaches have proven to be efficient. So I, I followed the first of all them and then I on top of that I added that. Do you see that there could be another layer? Another layer? Yeah, like not another layer, but maybe another method. Yes, we're investigating. Actually, we have a, a math student who is uh, doing work on this, and he's using deep learning. So he's using these uh, reference maps that I showed you before. Um, we don't really have uh, results on that yet, but uh, the problem with this is that it would likely not be transferable to uh, other seeds which is also a name of Indigo. Mm -hmm. So it would maybe solve uh, our specific problem, but... Uh, you would have them to uh, combine it again, or at least if you would apply it to another context, mm -hmm. you would then have to map it again. Maybe to give us a base structure where to apply deep learning. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in deep learning at all, but I would assume that you would uh, need to at least train the model again in okay. some in some way yeah. to adapt for a different scene. So that if we would train it for this specific scene, I'm quite sure that it would find that yeah. it would be biased towards this scene, whereas the yeah. other things would look different and would uh, <laughs> not work so well in one. Very last question. Do you think it's possible to use this to recreate the history of something over time? So if I was able to collect a bunch of images from this spot later, then is this the place to go? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean that that video that I've shown that that I've shown you that could be done for the whole Donut Canal, right? I mean, we could uh, we could have these textures, this texture changes for uh, every area that we we acquire images of. Or what was it? I'm thinking in, in retrospect, so a place that's already gone. Ah, could we use all these references? You mean historical images? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. I mean that that yes, of course, we could do this, uh, but. Uh, there the question is, um, how good are the images and how, uh, yeah. how is the overlap, for example, as you see, we need a quite specific way of taking these images. And once you took those images, you didn't think about this application, of course. So it's likely that um, it won't work, uh, work its way, but we are doing research on that in our research group to orient also historical images, but it's a lot more difficult.